The committee held that the dispute concerning the Al and Islands did not refer to a question which is left by international law to the domestic jurisdiction of Finland, thereby applying the exception rather than the rule elucidated above. Its grounds for departing from the general rule, however, was a very narrow one, namely, the Al and Islands agitation originated at a time when Finland was undergoing drastic political transformation. The internal situation of Finland was, according to the committee, so abnormal that, for a considerable time, the conditions required for the formation of a sovereign state did not exist. In the midst of revolution, anarchy, and civil war, the legitimacy of the Finnish national government was disputed by a large section of the people, and it had, in fact, been chased from the capital and forcibly prevented from carrying out its duties. The armed camps and the police were divided into two opposing forces. In light of these circumstances, Finland was not, during the relevant time period, a definitively constituted sovereign state. The committee, therefore, found that Finland did not possess the right to withhold from a portion of its population the option to separate itself, a right which sovereign nations generally have with respect to their own populations. Turning now to the more specific category of indigenous peoples, this term has been used, in scholarship as well as international, regional, and state practices, to refer to groups with distinct cultures, histories, and connections to land, spiritual and otherwise, that have been forcibly incorporated into a larger governing society. These groups are regarded as indigenous since they are the living descendants of pre-invasion inhabitants of lands now dominated by others. Otherwise stated, indigenous peoples, nations, or communities are culturally distinctive groups that find themselves engulfed by settler societies born of the forces of empire and conquest. 164-164, examples of groups who have been regarded as indigenous peoples are the Maori of New Zealand and the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. As with the broader category of peoples, indigenous peoples situated within states do not have a general right to independence or secession from those states under international law, 165-165, but they do have rights amounting to what was discussed above as the right to internal self-determination. In a historic development last September 13, 2007, the UN General Assembly adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, through General Assembly Resolution 61-295. The vote was 143 to 4, the Philippines being included among those in favor, and the four voting against being Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US. The declaration clearly recognized the right of indigenous peoples to self-determination, encompassing the right to autonomy or self-government. To wit, Article 3. Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. Article 4. Indigenous peoples, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Article 5. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social and cultural institutions, while retaining their right to participate fully, if they so choose, in the political, economic, social and cultural life of the state. Self-government as used in international legal discourse pertaining to indigenous peoples, has been understood as equivalent to internal self-determination. 166-166, the extent of self-determination provided for in the UN DRIP is more particularly defined in its subsequent articles, some of which are quoted hereunder. Article 8. 1. Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. 2. States shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of, and redress for a. Any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples, or of their cultural values or ethnic identities. b. Any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories or resources. c. Any form of forced population transfer which has the aim or effect of violating or undermining any of their rights. d. 
any form of forced assimilation or integration. e. Any form of propaganda designed to promote or incite racial or ethnic discrimination directed against them. Article 21. 1. Indigenous peoples have the right, without discrimination, to the improvement of their economic and social conditions, including, inter alia, in the areas of education, employment, vocational training and retraining, housing, sanitation, health and social security. 2. States shall take effective measures and, where appropriate, special measures to ensure continuing improvement of their economic and social conditions. Particular attention shall be paid to the rights and special needs of indigenous elders, women, youth, children and persons with disabilities. Article 26. 1. Indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied or otherwise used or acquired. 2. Indigenous peoples have the right to own, use, develop and control the lands, territories and resources that they possess by reason of traditional ownership or other traditional occupation or use, as well as those which they have otherwise acquired. 3. States shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories and resources. Such recognition shall be conducted with due respect to the customs, traditions and land tenure systems of the indigenous peoples concerned. Article 30. 1. Military activities shall not take place in the lands or territories of indigenous peoples, unless justified by a relevant public interest or otherwise freely agreed with or requested by the indigenous peoples concerned. 2. States shall undertake effective consultations with the indigenous peoples concerned, through appropriate procedures and in particular through their representative institutions, prior to using their lands or territories for military activities. Article 32. 1. Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. 2. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free and informed consent prior to the approval of any project affecting their lands or territories and other resources, particularly in connection with the development, utilization or exploitation of mineral, water or other resources. 3. States shall provide effective mechanisms for just and fair redress for any such activities and appropriate measures shall be taken to mitigate adverse environmental, economic, social, cultural or spiritual impact. Article 37. 1. Indigenous peoples have the right to the recognition, observance and enforcement of treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements concluded with states or their successors and to have states honor and respect such treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements. 2. Nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as diminishing or eliminating the rights of indigenous peoples contained in treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements. Article 38. States in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples, shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of this declaration. Assuming that the UN DRIP, like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, must now be regarded as embodying customary international law, a question which the court need not definitively resolve here, the obligations enumerated therein do not strictly require the Republic to grant the Bangsamoro people, through the instrumentality of the BJE, the particular rights and powers provided for in the MOAD. Even the more specific provisions of the UN DRIP are general in scope, allowing for flexibility in its application by the different states. There is, for instance, no requirement in the UN DRIP that states now guarantee indigenous peoples their own police and internal security force. Indeed, Article 8 presupposes that it is the state which will provide protection for indigenous peoples against acts like the forced dispossession of their lands, a function that is normally performed by police officers. If the protection of a right so essential to indigenous people's identity is acknowledged to be the responsibility of the state, then surely the protection of rights less significant to them as such peoples would also be the duty of states. Nor is there in the UN DRIP an acknowledgement of the right of indigenous peoples to the aerial domain and atmospheric space. What it upholds, 
in Article 26 thereof, is the right of indigenous peoples to the lands, territories and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied or otherwise used or acquired. Moreover, the UN DRIP, while upholding the right of indigenous peoples to autonomy, does not obligate states to grant indigenous peoples the near independent status of an associated state. All the rights recognized in that document are qualified in Article 46 as follows. 1. Nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, people, group or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations or construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair, totally or in part, the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. Even if the UN DRIP were considered as part of the law of the land pursuant to Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, it would not suffice to uphold the validity of the MOAD so as to render its compliance with other laws unnecessary. It is, therefore, clear that the MOAD contains numerous provisions that cannot be reconciled with the Constitution and the laws as presently worded. Respondents proffer, however, that the signing of the MOAD alone would not have entailed any violation of law or grave abuse of discretion on their part precisely because it stipulates that the provisions thereof inconsistent with the laws shall not take effect until these laws are amended. They cite paragraph 7 of the Moad Strand on Governance quoted earlier, but which is reproduced below for convenience. 7. The parties agree that the mechanisms and modalities for the actual implementation of this Moad shall be spelt out in the Comprehensive Compact to mutually take such steps to enable it to occur effectively. Any provisions of the MOAD requiring amendments to the existing legal framework shall come into force upon signing of a comprehensive compact and upon effecting the necessary changes to the legal framework with due regard to non-derogation of prior agreements and within the stipulated time frame to be contained in the comprehensive compact. Indeed, the foregoing stipulation keeps many controversial provisions of the MOAD from coming into force until the necessary changes to the legal framework are effected. While the word constitution is not mentioned in the provision now under consideration or anywhere else in the MOAD, the term legal framework is certainly broad enough to include the constitution. Notwithstanding the suspensive clause, however, respondents, by their mere act of incorporating in the MOAD the provisions thereof regarding the associative relationship between the BJE and the central government, have already violated the Memorandum of Instructions from the President dated March 1, 2001, which states that the negotiations shall be conducted in accordance with XXX the principles of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of the Philippines. Emphasis supplied. Establishing an associative relationship between the BJE and the central government is, for the reasons already discussed, a preparation for independence, or worse, an implicit acknowledgement of an independent status already prevailing. Even apart from the above-mentioned memorandum, however, the MOAD is defective because the suspensive clause is invalid, as discussed below. The authority of the GRPP's negotiating panel to negotiate with the MILF is founded on EO No. 3, Section 5C, which states that there shall be established government peace negotiating panels for negotiations with different rebel groups to be appointed by the President as her official emissaries to conduct negotiations, dialogues, and face-to-face -face discussions with rebel groups. These negotiating panels are to report to the President through the PAP on the conduct and progress of the negotiations. It bears noting that the GRPP's panel, in exploring lasting solutions to the Moro problem through its negotiations with the MILF, was not restricted by EO No. 3 only to those options available under the laws as they presently stand. One of the components of a comprehensive peace process, which EO No. 3 collectively refers to as the paths to peace, is the pursuit of social, economic, and political reforms which may require new legislation or even constitutional amendments. Sec. 4A of EO No. 3, which reiterates Section 3A, of EO No. 125, 167 167, states. Section 4. The Six Paths to Peace. The components of the comprehensive peace process comprise the processes known as the Paths to Peace. 
these component processes are interrelated and not mutually exclusive, and must therefore be pursued simultaneously in a coordinated and integrated fashion. They shall include, but may not be limited to, the following. a. Pursuit of social, economic and political reforms. This component involves the vigorous implementation of various policies, reforms, programs and projects aimed at addressing the root causes of internal armed conflicts and social unrest. This may require administrative action, new legislation or even constitutional amendments. XXXX, emphasis supplied. The MOAD, therefore, may reasonably be perceived as an attempt of respondents to address, pursuant to this provision of EO No. 3, the root causes of the armed conflict in Mindanao. The EO authorized them to think outside the box, so to speak. Hence, they negotiated and were set on signing the MOAD that included various social, economic, and political reforms which cannot, however, all be accommodated within the present legal framework, and which thus would require new legislation and constitutional amendments. The inquiry on the legality of the suspensive clause, however, cannot stop here, because it must be asked whether the President herself may exercise the power delegated to the GRPP's panel under EO No. 3, Sec. 4a. The President cannot delegate a power that she herself does not possess. May the President, in the course of peace negotiations, agree to pursue reforms that would require new legislation and constitutional amendments, or should the reforms be restricted only to those solutions which the present laws allow? The answer to this question requires a discussion of the extent of the President's power to conduct peace negotiations. That the authority of the President to conduct peace negotiations with rebel groups is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution does not mean that she has no such authority. In San Lucas v. Executive Secretary, 168-168, an issue was the authority of the president to declare a state of rebellion, an authority which is not expressly provided for in the Constitution. The court held us. In her ponentia in Marcos v. Manlipas, Justice Cortes put her thesis into jurisprudence. There, the court, by a slim made seven margin, upheld the president's power to forbid the return of her exile predecessor. The rationale for the majority's ruling rested on the president's. Dot. Unstated residual powers which are implied from the grant of executive power and which are necessary for her to comply with her duties under the Constitution. The powers of the President are not limited to what are expressly enumerated in the article on the Executive Department and in scattered provisions of the Constitution. This is so, notwithstanding the avowed intent of the members of the Constitutional Commission of 1986 to limit the powers of the President as a reaction to the abuses under the regime of Mr. Marcos, for the result was a limitation of specific powers of the President, particularly those relating to the Commander-in-Chief Clause, but not a diminution of the general grant of executive power. Thus, the President's authority to declare a state of rebellion springs in the main from her powers as Chief Executive and at the same time, draw strength from her commander-in-chief powers. XXX, emphasis and underscoring supplied. Similarly, the president's power to conduct peace negotiations is implicitly included in her powers as chief executive and commander-in-chief. As chief executive, the president has the general responsibility to promote public peace, and as commander-in-chief, she has the more specific duty to prevent and suppress rebellion and lawless violence. 169-169. As the experience of nations which have similarly gone through internal armed conflict will show, however, peace is rarely attained by simply pursuing a military solution. Oftentimes, changes as far-reaching as a fundamental reconfiguration of the nation's constitutional structure is required. The observations of Dr. Kirsty Samuels are enlightening, to wit. XXX. The he fact remains that a successful political and governance transition must form the core of any post-conflict peace-building mission. As we have observed in Liberia and Haiti over the last ten years, conflict cessation without modification of the political environment, even where state-building is undertaken through technical electoral assistance and institution or capacity-building, is unlikely to succeed. On average, 
more than 50% of states emerging from conflict return to conflict. Moreover, a substantial proportion of transitions have resulted in weak or limited democracies. The design of a constitution and its constitution-making process can play an important role in the political and governance transition. Constitution-making after conflict is an opportunity to create a common vision of the future of a state and a roadmap on how to get there. The constitution can be partly a peace agreement and partly a framework setting up the rules by which the new democracy will operate. 170-170 In the same vein, Professor Christine Bell, in her article on the nature and legal status of peace agreements, observed that the typical way that peace agreements establish or confirm mechanisms for demilitarization and immobilization is by linking them to new constitutional structures addressing governance, elections, and legal and human rights institutions. 171-171 In the Philippine experience, the link between peace agreements and constitution-making has been recognized by no less than the framers of the Constitution. Behind the provisions of the Constitution on Autonomous Regions 172-172, is the framers' intention to implement a particular peace agreement, namely, the Tripoli Agreement of 1976 between the GRP and the MNLF signed by then Under Secretary of National Defense Carmelo Z. Barbero and then MNLF Chairman Nurma Swari. Mr. Romulo. There are other speakers, so, although I have some more questions, I will reserve my right to ask them if they are not covered by the other speakers. I have only two questions. I heard one of the commissioners say that local autonomy already exists in the Muslim region, it is working very well, it has, in fact diminished a great deal of the problems. So, my question is, since that already exists, why do we have to go into something new? Mr. Opal. May I answer that on behalf of Chairman Naido? Commissioner Yusuf Abubakar is right that certain definite steps have been taken to implement the provisions of the Tripoli Agreement with respect to an autonomous region in Mindanao. This is a good first step. But there is no question that this is merely a partial response to the Tripoli Agreement itself and to the fuller standard of regional autonomy contemplated in that agreement, and now by state policy. 173-173, Emphasis Supplied The constitutional provisions on autonomy and the statutes enacted pursuant to them have, to the credit of their drafters, been partly successful. Nonetheless, the Filipino people are still faced with the reality of an ongoing conflict between the government and the MILF. If the president is to be expected to find means for bringing this conflict to an end and to achieve lasting peace in Mindanao, then she must be given the leeway to explore, in the course of peace negotiations, solutions that may require changes to the constitution for their implementation. Being uniquely vested with the power to conduct peace negotiations with rebel groups, the President is in a singular position to know the precise nature of their grievances which, if resolved, may bring an end to hostilities. The President may not, of course, unilaterally implement the solutions that she considers viable, but she may not be prevented from submitting them as recommendations to Congress, which could then, if it is minded, act upon them pursuant to the legal procedures for constitutional amendment and revision. In particular, Congress would have the option, pursuant to Article 17, Sections 1 and 3 of the Constitution, to propose the recommended amendments or revision to the people, call a constitutional convention, or submit to the electorate the question of calling such a convention. While the President does not possess constituent powers, as those powers may be exercised only by Congress, a constitutional convention, or the people through initiative and referendum, she may submit proposals for constitutional change to Congress in a manner that does not involve the irrigation of constituent powers. Insanidad v. Cumlec, 174-174, an issue was the legality of then-President Marcos Act of directly submitting proposals for constitutional amendments to a referendum bypassing the Interim National Assembly which was the body vested by the 1973 Constitution with the power to propose such amendments. President Marcos, it will be recalled, never convened the Interim National Assembly. The majority upheld the President's Act, 
holding that the urges of absolute necessity compelled the president as the agent of the people to act as he did, there being no interim National Assembly to propose constitutional amendments. Against this ruling, Justices T. Hankey and Munoz Palma vigorously dissented. The court's concern at present, however, is not with regard to the point on which it was then divided in that controversial case, but on that which was not disputed by either side. Justice T. Hankey's dissent, 175-175, in particular, bears noting. While he disagreed that the president may directly submit proposed constitutional amendments to a referendum, implicit in his opinion is a recognition that he would have upheld the president's action along with the majority had the president convened the interim National Assembly and coursed his proposals through it. Thus Justice D. Hankey opined. Since the Constitution provides for the organization of the essential departments of government, defines and delimits the powers of each and prescribes the manner of the exercise of such powers, and the constituent power has not been granted to but has been withheld from the President or Prime Minister, it follows that the President's question decrees proposing and submitting constitutional amendments directly to the people, without the intervention of the interim National Assembly in whom the power is expressly vested, are devoid of constitutional and legal basis. 176-176, Emphasis Supplied From the foregoing discussion, the principle may be inferred that the President, in the course of conducting peace negotiations, may validly consider implementing even those policies that require changes to the Constitution, but she may not unilaterally implement them without the intervention of Congress, or act in any way as if the assent of that body were assumed as a certainty. Since, under the present Constitution, the people also have the power to directly propose amendments through initiative and referendum, the President may also submit her recommendations to the people, not as a formal proposal to be voted on in a plebiscite similar to what President Marcos did in Sanidad, but for their independent consideration of whether these recommendations merit being formally proposed through initiative. These recommendations, however, may amount to nothing more than the President's suggestions to the people, for any further involvement in the process of initiative by the chief executive may vitiate its character as a genuine people's initiative. The only initiative recognized by the Constitution is that which truly proceeds from the people. As the court stated in Lambino v. Cumlec, 177-177. The Lambino group claims that their initiative is the people's voice. However, the Lambino group unabashedly states in OLAP Resolution No. 2602, in the verification of their petition with the Cumlec, that OLAP maintains its unqualified support to the agenda of Her Excellency President Gloria Macapagaloroyo for constitutional reforms. The Lambino group thus admits that their people's initiative is an unqualified support to the agenda of the incumbent president to change the constitution. This forewarns the court to be wary of incantations of people's voice or sovereign will in the present initiative. It will be observed that the president has authority, as stated in her oath of office, 178-178, only to preserve and defend the constitution. Such presidential power does not, however, extend to allowing her to change the constitution, but simply to recommend proposed amendments or revision. As long as she limits herself to recommending these changes and submits to the proper procedure for constitutional amendments and revision, her mere recommendation need not be construed as an unconstitutional act. The foregoing discussion focused on the President's authority to propose constitutional amendments, since her authority to propose new legislation is not in controversy. It has been an accepted practice for Presidents in this jurisdiction to propose new legislation. One of the more prominent instances the practice is usually done is in the yearly State of the Nation Address of the President to Congress. Moreover, the annual General Appropriations Bill has always been based on the budget prepared by the President, which, for all intents and purposes, is a proposal for new legislation coming from the President. 179-179 the suspensive clause in the MOAD viewed in light of the above discussed standards. Given the limited nature of the President's authority to propose constitutional amendments, she cannot guarantee to any third party that the required amendments will eventually be put in place, nor even be submitted to a plebiscite. 
The most she could do is submit these proposals as recommendations either to Congress or the people, in whom constituent powers are vested. Paragraph 7 on governance of the Moad states, however, that all provisions thereof which cannot be reconciled with the present constitution and laws shall come into force upon signing of a comprehensive compact and upon effecting the necessary changes to the legal framework. This stipulation does not bear the marks of a suspensive condition, defined in civil law as a future and uncertain event, but of a term. It is not a question of whether the necessary changes to the legal framework will be effected, but when. That there is no uncertainty being contemplated is plain from what follows, for the paragraph goes on to state that the contemplated changes shall be with due regard to non-derogation of prior agreements and within the stipulated time frame to be contained in the comprehensive compact. Pursuant to this stipulation, therefore, it is mandatory for the GRP to effect the changes to the legal framework contemplated in the MOAD, which changes would include constitutional amendments as discussed earlier. It bears noting that by the time these changes are put in place, the MOAD itself would be counted among the prior agreements from which there could be no derogation. What remains for discussion in the Comprehensive Compact would merely be the implementing details for these consensus points and, notably, the deadline for effecting the contemplated changes to the legal framework. Plainly, Stipulation paragraph 7 on governance is inconsistent with the limits of the President's authority to propose constitutional amendments, it being a virtual guarantee that the Constitution and the laws of the Republic of the Philippines will certainly be adjusted to conform to all the consensus points found in the MOAD. Hence, it must be struck down as unconstitutional. A comparison between the suspensive clause of the MOAD with a similar provision appearing in the 1996 final peace agreement between the MNLF and the GRP is most instructive. As a backdrop, the parties to the 1996 agreement stipulated that it would be implemented in two phases. Phase I covered a three-year transitional period involving the putting up of new administrative structures through executive order, such as the Special Zone of Peace and Development (ZOPAD) in the Southern Philippines Council for Peace and Development SPCPD, while Phase II covered the establishment of the new regional autonomous government through amendment or repeal of RA No. 6734, which was then the Organic Act of the Arm. The stipulations on Phase II consisted of specific agreements on the structure of the expanded autonomous region envisioned by the parties. To that extent, they are similar to the provisions of the MOAD. There is, however, a crucial difference between the two agreements. While the MOAD virtually guarantees that the necessary changes to the legal framework will be put in place, the GRPMNLF Final Peace Agreement states thus, accordingly, these provisions, on Phase 2, shall be recommended by the GRP to Congress for incorporation in the amendatory or repealing law. Concerns have been raised that the MOAD would have given rise to a binding international law obligation on the part of the Philippines to change its constitution in conformity thereto, on the ground that it may be considered either as a binding agreement under international law, or a unilateral declaration of the Philippine government to the international community that it would grant to the Banks and Moro people law the concessions therein stated. Neither ground finds sufficient support in international law, however. The MOAD as earlier mentioned in the overview thereof, would have included foreign dignitaries as signatories. In addition, representatives of other nations were invited to witness its signing in Kuala Lumpur. These circumstances readily lead one to surmise that the MOAD would have had the status of a binding international agreement had it been signed. An examination of the prevailing principles in international law, however, leads to the contrary conclusion. The decision on challenge to jurisdiction Lomé Accord Amnesty 180-180, the Lomé Accord case, of the Special Court of Sierra Leone is enlightening. The Lomé Accord was a peace agreement signed on July 7, 1999 between the government of Sierra Leone and the Revolutionary United Front, RUF, a rebel group with which the Sierra Leone government had been in armed conflict for around eight years at the time of signing. There were non-contracting signatories to the agreement among which were the government of the Togolese Republic, the Economic Community of West African States, and the UN. On January 16, 2002, 
After a successful negotiation between the UN Secretary General and the Sierra Leone government, another agreement was entered into by the UN and that government whereby the Special Court of Sierra Leone was established. The sole purpose of the Special Court, an international court, was to try persons who bore the greatest responsibility for serious violations of international humanitarian law and Sierra Leonean law committed in the territory of Sierra Leone since November 30, 1996. Among the stipulations of the Lome Accord was a provision for the full pardon of the members of the RUF with respect to anything done by them in pursuit of their objectives as members of that organization since the conflict began. In the Lome Accord case, the defense argued that the accord created an internationally binding obligation not to prosecute the beneficiaries of the amnesty provided therein, citing, among other things, the participation of foreign dignitaries and international organizations in the finalization of that agreement. The special court, however, rejected this argument, ruling that the Lomé Accord is not a treaty and that it can only create binding obligations and rights between the parties in municipal law, not in international law. Hence, the special court held, it is ineffective in depriving an international court like it of jurisdiction. 37. In regard to the nature of a negotiated settlement of an internal armed conflict it is easy to assume and to argue with some degree of plausibility, as defense counsel for the defendants seem to have done, that the mere fact that in addition to the parties to the conflict, the document formalizing the settlement is signed by foreign heads of state or their representatives and representatives of international organizations, means the agreement of the parties is internationalized so as to create obligations in international law. XXXX. 40. Almost every conflict resolution will involve the parties to the conflict and the mediator or facilitator of the settlement, or persons or bodies under whose auspices the settlement took place but who are not at all parties to the conflict, are not contracting parties and who do not claim any obligation from the contracting parties or incur any obligation from the settlement. 41. In this case, the parties to the conflict are the lawful authority of the state and the rough which has no status of statehood and is to all intents and purposes a faction within the state. The non-contracting signatories of the Lomé Agreement were moral guarantors of the principle that, in the terms of Article 34 of the agreement, this peace agreement is implemented with integrity and in good faith by both parties. The moral guarantors assumed no legal obligation. It is recalled that the UN by its representative appended presumably for avoidance of doubt, an understanding of the extent of the agreement to be implemented as not including certain international crimes. 42. An international agreement in the nature of a treaty must create rights and obligations regulated by international law so that a breach of its terms will be a breach determined under international law which will also provide principal means of enforcement. The Lomé Agreement created neither rights nor obligations capable of being regulated by international law. An agreement such as the Lomé Agreement which brings to an end an internal armed conflict no doubt creates a factual situation of restoration of peace that the international community acting through the Security Council may take note of. That, however, will not convert it to an international agreement which creates an obligation enforceable in international, as distinguished from municipal, law. A breach of the terms of such a peace agreement resulting in resumption of internal armed conflict or creating a threat to peace in the determination of the Security Council may indicate a reversal of the factual situation of peace to be visited with possible legal consequences arising from the new situation of conflict created. Such consequences such as action by the Security Council pursuant to Chapter 7 arise from the situation and not from the agreement, nor from the obligation imposed by it. Such action cannot be regarded as a remedy for the breach. A peace agreement which settles an internal armed conflict cannot be ascribed the same status as one which settles an international armed conflict which, essentially, must be between two or more warring states. The Lomé Agreement cannot be characterized as an international instrument. XXX, emphasis, italics and underscoring supplied. Similarly, that the MOAD would have been signed by representatives of states and international organizations not parties to the agreement would not have sufficed to vest in it a binding character under international law. In another vein, 
Concern has been raised that the MOAD would amount to a unilateral declaration of the Philippine state, binding under international law, that it would comply with all the stipulations stated therein, with the result that it would have to amend its constitution accordingly regardless of the true will of the people. Cited as authority for this view is Australia v. France, 181-181, also known as the Nuclear Tests Case, decided by the International Court of Justice. ICJ. In the nuclear tests case, Australia challenged before the ICJ the legality of France's nuclear tests in the South Pacific. France refused to appear in the case, but public statements from its president, and similar statements from other French officials including its Minister of Defence, that its 1974 series of atmospheric tests would be its last, persuaded the ICJ to dismiss the case. 182-182 those statements, the ICJ held, amounted to a legal undertaking addressed to the international community, which required no acceptance from other states for it to become effective. Essential to the ICJ ruling is its finding that the French government intended to be bound to the international community in issuing its public statements, viz. 43. It is well recognized that declarations made by way of unilateral acts, concerning legal or factual situations, may have the effect of creating legal obligations. Declarations of this kind may be, and often are, very specific. When it is the intention of the state making the declaration that it should become bound according to its terms, that intention confers on the declaration the character of a legal undertaking, the state being thenceforth legally required to follow a course of conduct consistent with the declaration. An undertaking of this kind, if given publicly, and with an intent to be bound, even though not made within the context of international negotiations, is binding. In these circumstances, nothing in the nature of a quid pro quo nor any subsequent acceptance of the declaration, nor even any reply or reaction from other states, is required for the declaration to take effect, since such a requirement would be inconsistent with the strictly unilateral nature of the juridical act by which the pronouncement by the state was made. 44. Of course, not all unilateral acts imply obligation, but a state may choose to take up a certain position in relation to a particular matter with the intention of being bound the intention is to be ascertained by interpretation of the act. When states make statements by which their freedom of action is to be limited, a restrictive interpretation is called for. XXXX 51. In announcing that the 1974 series of atmospheric tests would be the last, the French government conveyed to the world at large, including the applicant, its intention effectively to terminate these tests. It was bound to assume that other states might take note of these statements and rely on their being effective. The validity of these statements and their legal consequences must be considered within the general framework of the security of international intercourse, and the confidence and trust which are so essential in the relations among states. It is from the actual substance of these statements, and from the circumstances attending their making, that the legal implications of the unilateral act must be deduced. The objects of these statements are clear and they were addressed to the international community as a whole, and the court holds that they constitute an undertaking possessing legal effect. The court considers 270 that the President of the Republic, in deciding upon the effective cessation of atmospheric tests, gave an undertaking to the international community to which his words were addressed. XXX, emphasis and underscoring supplied. As gathered from the above quoted ruling of the ICJ, public statements of a state representative may be construed as a unilateral declaration only when the following conditions are present, the statements were clearly addressed to the international community, the state intended to be bound to the community by its statements and that not to give legal effect to those statements would be detrimental to the security of international intercourse. Plainly, unilateral declarations arise only in peculiar circumstances. The limited applicability of the nuclear tests case ruling was recognized in a later case decided by the ICJ entitled Burkina Faso v. Mali, 183-183, also known as the case concerning the frontier dispute. The public declaration subject of that case was a statement made by the President of Mali, in an interview by a foreign press agency. 
that Mali would abide by the decision to be issued by a commission of the Organization of African Unity on a frontier dispute then pending between Mali and Burkina Faso. Unlike in the nuclear tests case, the ICJ held that the statement of Mali's president was not a unilateral act with legal implications. It clarified that its ruling in the nuclear tests case rested on the peculiar circumstances surrounding the French declaration subject thereof, to wit. 40. In order to assess the intentions of the author of a unilateral act, account must be taken of all the factual circumstances in which the act occurred. For example, in the nuclear tests cases, the court took the view that since the applicant states were not the only ones concerned at the possible continuance of atmospheric testing by the French government, that government's unilateral declarations had conveyed to the world at large, including the applicant, its intention effectively to terminate these tests, ICJ reports 1974, p. 269, para. 51, p. 474, para. 53. In the particular circumstances of those cases, the French government could not express an intention to be bound otherwise than by unilateral declarations. It is difficult to see how it could have accepted the terms of a negotiated solution with each of the applicants without thereby jeopardizing its contention that its conduct was lawful. The circumstances of the present case are radically different. Here, there was nothing to hinder the parties from manifesting an intention to accept the binding character of the conclusions of the Organization of African Unity Mediation Commission by the normal method, a formal agreement on the basis of reciprocity. Since no agreement of this kind was concluded between the parties, the Chamber finds that there are no grounds to interpret the declaration made by Mali's head of state on April 11, 1975 as a unilateral act with legal implications in regard to the present case. Emphasis Contrary and the assertion of respondents that the non-signing of the, 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 the above criteria, dissolution of it the would not GRP have amounted to a unilateral the present declaration on the part the of court the court finds that the present international community provide an exception the to the mood and academic did not draft in the same with the clear a, intention of grave violation of the constitutional, constitutional community as a whole or to any exceptional character only to the situation and paramount there were state interest international organizations and formulate controlling ways or to guide the bench negotiation and project signing of the MOAD, D, they participated the merely as witnesses of repetition in the case of Malaysia, Malaysia, review as facilitator. The MOAD is a as significant part of a series case. of agreements the mere necessary fact that in addition to the GRP no triple agreement the on peace settlement signed by, signed by representatives back in June and 2001 and organizations Hence, does not the mean that the MOAD can be renationalized so as to one drawn up that contain similar or significantly dissimilar provisions the MOAD were not addressed to states the court not to give legal effect finds that the prayers would not and damage have been the rendered the security of any national respondents actually the trusting court and the petitioner the relations of the final draft of the moad in its own respect the circumstances surrounding the moad are closer to the public king or fossil wherein as already discussed article 3 the Mali of the constitution statements was not helped to bind a unilateral declaration by the ICJ of all its transactions involving there was also nothing to hinder the film of the panel Article really two of the Constitution be bound to the other right states to information and guarantee the right of the by people formal to demand information. Here, while Section that formal agreement would have come about by the inclusion of in the MOAD of a clear nobody demand to be legally bound the to the international to exercise of not the right just to information and by an equally clear complementation that this on public participation derived the same self-executory nature and acceptance of that only to reasonable safeguards entering into such a formal agreement may be not binding by law. The loss of face for the contents of the MOAD that is a matter of international community, public concern which was one of public the interest in the highest order. The French government and declaring that the into right formal information with other countries steps in negotiations that the Philippine panel did not enter into such a formal agreement. The jurisprudence finds no, no intention to be bound to the international nature or commercial on that ground. The, the MOAD may not be considered a unilateral declaration under international law. dialogue or process the MOAD not be a doctrine that the government and the Philippines under international law notwithstanding rights is the design 
line for feedback on mechanisms act of guarantee the right to public to the legal framework is to by be a species of these public to rights constitute grave abuse at least of three discretion and laws the animate these constitutes not an imperative they can justify the as exercise of the, the people as right to be consulted on relevant the matters within the state to the peace and their brazen willingness to guarantee one, that Congress and the sovereign is repleting the mechanics would give their new consultation solution on both national holding such an act would have a principle reform the consensus build constituent power in fact it only is the duty of the president constitutional convention process or the people that regular dialogue process of initial relevant information only way that the executive can ensure the outcome of recommendations from peace partners and concerned sectors or interference with that process to Republic Act No. 7160 or the local the government of giving up the portion of its own territory requires all national lawsuits to peace. conduct for its change the before any project or program critical to the so environment and change is not consistent including those that make an international law of a particular group of people residing in such locality Respond as is one however, peculiar program not that unequivocally and unilaterally vests ownership of a vast territory. The are right for more education, which could pervasively and drastically result to the, the diaspora government or the displacement of a great number of inhabitants from their total by environment. From their mandate three, under Rio Republic number three, Act No. 8, moreover, 371 of their indigenous people's the rights act of 1997 to the provides for clear cut procedure for the recognition and delineation of an ancestral government is a a matter for Among other things, review, the observance as of the petitions and prior constitutional issues which are of paramount public interest or of transcendental importance. The Notably, court grants the petition is not petitioners an intervention and or any government agency the power to delineate and recognize the ancestral domain claimed by mere agreement or compromise. Or Arroyo. The invocation of the doctrine of executive privilege as a defense to the general right to information or the specific right to consultation is untenable. The various explicit legal provisions fly in the face of executive secrecy. In any event, respondents effectively waived such defense after it unconditionally disclosed the official copies of the final draft of the MOAD, for judicial compliance and public scrutiny. In sum, the presidential adviser on the peace process committed grave abuse of discretion when he failed to carry out the pertinent consultation process, as mandated by EO No. 3. Republic Act No. 7160, and Republic Act No. 8371. The furtive process by which the MOAD was designed and crafted runs contrary to and in excess of the legal authority, and amounts to a whimsical, capricious, oppressive, arbitrary and despotic exercise thereof. It illustrates a gross evasion of positive duty and a virtual refusal to perform the duty enjoined. The MOAD cannot be reconciled with the present constitution and laws. Not only its specific provisions but the very concept underlying them, namely, the associative relationship envisioned between the GRP and the BJE, are unconstitutional, for the concept presupposes that the associated entity is a state and implies that the same is on its way to independence. While there is a clause in the MOAD stating that the provisions thereof inconsistent with the present legal framework will not be effective until that framework is amended, the same does not cure its defect. The inclusion of provisions in the MOAD establishing an associative relationship between the BJE and the central government is, itself, a violation of the Memorandum of Instructions from the President dated March 1, 2001, addressed to the Government Peace Panel. Moreover, as the clause is worded, it virtually guarantees that the necessary amendments to the Constitution and the laws will eventually be put in place. Neither the GRP Peace Panel nor the President herself is authorized to make such a guarantee. Upholding such an act would amount to authorizing the usurpation of the constituent powers vested only in Congress, a constitutional convention, or the people themselves through the process of initiative. For the only way that the executive can ensure the outcome of the amendment process is through an undue influence or interference with that process. While the MOAD would not amount to an international agreement or unilateral declaration binding on the Philippines under international law, Respondents' Act of Guaranteeing Amendments is, by itself, already a constitutional violation that renders the MOAD fatally defective. Wherefore, Respondents' motion to dismiss is denied. The main and intervening petitions are given due course and hereby granted.
the Memorandum of Agreement on the Ancestral Domain aspect of the GRP MILF Tribly Agreement on Peace of 2001 is declared contrary to law and the Constitution. So ordered. Conchita Carpio Morales. Associate Justice.